Open your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians at chapter number 1. Ephesians at chapter 1. I want to preach through the book of Ephesians talking about the riches of God's grace. Ephesians at chapter 1, verses 1 through verse number 6. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted, in the beloved. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> the grass withers and the flower thereof fades away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The riches of God's grace. In, in 1916, there was a woman named Hetty Green who died a millionaire to the tune of over $100 million. $100 million was an unthinkable amount of money in that time, and it is definitely a large amount of money even in this time. But Hetty Green died a miser. She was so cheap that she ate cold oatmeal because it was too expensive to warm it up. Her son had a leg injury and she looked for months for a free clinic until her son's leg had to be amputated. Matter of fact, Hetty Green died of a heart attack arguing over the price of a carton of skim milk because she didn't think it should cost as much as a carton of whole milk. She was worth $100 million when she died, but she left this world a miser. A person that perhaps you would know or have heard of is a woman by the name of Leona Helmsley. Leona Helmsley was the head uh, of a large hotel chain in New, in New York, uh, Helmsley Palace Hotels. She died in the early 2000s worth over $8 billion. But she was so cheap that she had a man to build a barbecue pit in her backyard to the tune of $13,000. And just not to pay for it, she complained of shoddy workmanship. And she did not pay the man who begged her for the money because he had six children to feed. And her answer to him was, you should have kept your pants up so that you wouldn't have so many children. She was worth $8 billion and was so mean and cheap that a movie was made about her called The Queen of Mean. Many of us here today have not appropriated the riches that belong to us in Jesus Christ. We are rich beyond measure because of what God did for us in the person of Jesus Christ, but we live like paupers, although Christ has given us riches on our behalf because of his grace and his love toward us, we have a postgraduate blessing with a grammar school understanding. And so we leave this world misers. 
Jesus. Perhaps uh, we've amassed a whole lot materially, but we are poor spiritually. Walk with me around the text. The book of Ephesus, the letter to the church at Ephesus, was written by the Apostle Paul in around about A.D. 61 or A.D. 62. For Paul wanted the opportunity to go to Asia because uh, Ephesus was known as the Queen of Asia, uh, the Temple of Diana, uh, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was in the city of Ephesus. And Paul wanted an opportunity to preach there in Ephesus, but the Spirit forbade him going to Asia Minor, and he winds up in Macedonia because he sees a vision of a man from Macedonia who says, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so Paul delays his preaching in Ephesus, and uh, he goes to Macedonia, but Priscilla and Aquila uh, bring the gospel uh, to Ephesus, and Timothy is left there as the preacher and pastor to that church. But Paul went to Ephesus and preached and taught the gospel for three years. Uh, but this church is now uh, suffering through great persecution and they um, have not yet appropriated what God has done for them in Jesus Christ. Paul reminds them in chapters 1, 2, and 3 what their riches are and in chapter 4, 5, and 6, he teaches them how to use those riches. Chapter 1, 2, and 3 is about orthodoxy. Chapter 4, 5, and 6 is about orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is a right doctrine, and orthopraxy is a right practice of that doctrine because what you believe dictates how you behave. If you believe that you are rich in Christ, you ought to behave like you are rich in Christ. If you believe that God has done something for you that you could never have done for yourself, then it ought to show on your face. It ought to show in your actions. It ought to show in how you worship. If you're rich, you ought to worship like you're rich. You ought to praise God like you are wealthy because we have something money can't buy. Uh, in, 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 in verse number three, uh, in verse number four, five, and six, the scripture tells us what we ought to give God praise for. We ought to praise God, first of all, brothers and sisters, because he's been so charitable towards us. God has just lavished us with grace. God has just poured out rich blessings on each and every one of us. God has just showered us. God has been beneficent and benevolent with every last one of us because he has made us rich with blessing. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Look with me at the source of our blessing. The source of our blessing is in that verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here, here, here's how you ought to bless God. Uh, that, that word blessed in the text gives us our English word for eulogy. To eulogize. To speak kindly of. To speak well of somebody. We ought to eulogize God when we come to church. We ought to eulogize God when we think about his goodness and his grace and his mercy towards us. We ought to have a word ready on our lips to give God a eulogy. Uh, to give God a, a word of thanks. A word of commendation. Because the source of our blessing is God the Father. Hear me, hear me, brothers and sisters. Uh, the source of your blessing is not your employment. <laughs> because your employment can change. I wish I had a witness here. The source of your blessing is not that fool in the White House. Because presidents come and go. 
Your source of blessing is not your degree or, or your accomplishments. Your source of blessing comes from God. Because when you know God is the source of your strength, when you know God is the river from which your blessings flow, it causes you to eulogize God. The only folk who know how to shout like that are people who know where their blessings come from. Uh, the psalmist helps us right here. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? I wish I had a Bible reader. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He will not suffer even my foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Come on, you can help me say it. The Lord is my keeper. The Lord is the shade upon my right hand. The sun shall not smite me by day, nor the moon by night. For the Lord shall preserve my soul. He shall preserve me from all evil. He'll preserve my going out and my coming in from this time forth. And even forever, the source of my blessing is God the Father. Mm. Now let's look a moment in that same verse at the subject of our blessing. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. The God of the universe has blessed us. Uh, all of us are, are blessed today. If you woke up this morning, you're blessed. If you can breathe, if you dress yourself, I wish I had two or three witnesses, if you had a roof over your head, if you had food to eat, if you got a job in the morning, if you got the activity of your limbs, if you can move and talk and walk, you are blessed. Uh, the Old Testament scripture says you're blessed in the country. You're blessed in the field. You're blessed going out. You're blessed coming in. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. Although there be no cattle in the store. I wish I had a Bible reader. Though there be no fruit on the vine. Yet will I praise God. Because no matter what life or circumstance comes my way. I shout because I'm blessed. You are the subject of the sword. But in that same verse, we move from source and subject to the scope of these blessings. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, here is the scope, with all spiritual blessings. All spiritual blessings. You're going to take, you're gonna have to let, let, let me take a minute here. I'm not talking about material blessings. Uh, because a car is a material blessing. Some shoes is a material blessing. A house is a material blessing. That's, that's, that's good. You need that. You got to have that. But there are some things that's bigger than a house. That's bigger than a car. That's bigger than a job. You can't pay for a good night's sleep. You can't pay for peace in the midst of your storm. You can't pay for calm when everything around you is falling apart. There are some things money can't buy. That's the reason folk look at you, look at you real strange. When they know your world is a wreck, but you still come to church. You lost just about everything you have, but you still give God the glory. 
because there are some spiritual blessings that money can't buy. Uh, you, you remember in the book of Job, Job lost everything he had. I need two or three more Bible readers. Uh, Mrs. Job said you ought to curse God and die. Job said we don't just receive good at God's hand. And when evil comes, we turn against God. He says, naked came I from my mother's womb. And naked I shall return. The Lord gives. Come on, you can help me say it. And the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of all the days of my appointed time. I'm going to wait until my change comes. Though he slay me. Yet will I put my trust in him. When you got spiritual blessings, you don't worry about what's going on outside you because it can't disturb what's going on inside you. Yeah. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Here's the, here's the scope of that blessing in heavenly places. In heavenly places. Uh, the stuff that God has for me that can never be touched is in heavenly places. Uh, um, uh, moth can't corrupt it. Thieves cannot break through and steal it. For the thief comes, the scripture says, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come, says the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Abundant life is something that you possess that nothing that ever happens to you can take away that joy. Um, uh, brothers and sisters, when you have it, it's, it's, it's way up there in heavenly places. A and you can access it on Monday. You can get your hands on it on Thursday. You don't even have to be at Lily Grove because it's in heavenly places. Uh, Lily Grove is an earthly place to come and worship. But if you're a real worshiper, you don't need a designated place to worship. Wherever you are, you make that place your sanctuary. If it's your car, if it's on your lunch break, if it's at house watching television, wherever you are and you think about the grace and the riches of Christ, that place becomes your sanctuary. I'm, 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 trying to, I'm trying to move on to verse number four, but those of us who are radical worshipers, those of us who worship radically don't need an audience. We don't need any music. We don't need nobody helping us. We don't have to be at church on Sunday morning. When we sitting down by ourselves, we know how to have church because when we think of the riches that belong to us in Christ, if nobody else wants to give God glory, if nobody else wants to open their mouth, if nobody on my row wants to shout hallelujah, if nobody in the section where I'm seated wants to give God glory, you ain't going to stop me. You're not going to bother my praise because I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus and I'm going to give God the glory because the riches that belong to me are in heavenly places. Here it is. In Christ. My blessings are in Christ. Uh, my pastor, M.C. Hammer, says for me to tell the devil, you can't touch this. 
You can lie on me, but you can't touch this. You can say I'm not going to ever be anything, but the blessings I have that are in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, you can't get to that. And don't let anybody dampen your enthusiasm and hush you when you're trying to praise God because they don't know how much your praise has cost you. You've been through too much. You've suffered through too much. You've cried too much. You've had too much pain. And God has blessed you to come out of that. You have spiritual blessing. In the heavenly realms, in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. That's God's charity to us in verse 3. But in verse number 4, God chose us. He's been charitable towards us. But his charity extends in verse 4 to the very fact that God made a choice of us. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. God chose us. He chose us. He chose us. He chose us. He chose us. That, that word chose in the text means to choose from among different options. Uh, God had some more options, but he chose me. I wish I had a real shouter in here this morning. Somebody better than me died this morning, but God chose to give me another chance. Somebody more worthy didn't meet than I am couldn't wake up this morning, but God chose to give me one more day. And because God made a choice of me, I choose him. Now listen, that, that choosing of us spills over into verse number five, having predestinated us. God predestinated us. His choosing of us is the theological word election. God elected us. Uh, some people have a problem with God's election because they think that for God to elect to save some and others would lose or go to hell, they think that God has been unfair. But, but let me see if I can make that make sense for you. God didn't have to choose anybody. But that he chose somebody is all because of his sovereign grace. Now listen to me, beloved. There is this tension in the text when you get to that word predestination. There is this, this struggle, this pull, this tension in the text between sovereign uh, uh, choosing an election predestination on one end and human responsibility on the other end God is sovereign and he, say, he elects to save whom he pleases but then those who would come to him he saves to the utmost God chooses whom he wants to choose but then those who choose to come to him he saves to the utmost. Now, predestination is not God looking through the corridors of time and seeing that you would come to him. So since he already knows because he knows everything, he just chooses you because he knows that you will choose him. God chose you before you chose him. On one hand is predestination. Stay with me. I'm almost through. On the other hand, is free will. God sovereignly elects. He predestines on one hand, and then people choose to come to God, and he saves to the utmost. So how can we, how can we 
reconcile these two opposing distinctions. God's sovereign election and human responsibility. One is on this side and one is on the other side. How can we reconcile the sovereignty of God and my free will? I'm glad you asked. Uh, sovereignty and free will. Look at it like railroad tracks. Railroad tracks are two tracks, one train. The train needs both tracks to run on. Are you still with me? On one track is sovereign predestination. On the other track is human free will. But listen to what happens when you look at a train track long enough. If you stand on the tracks of a train and watch it long enough, the two rails eventually come together. Eventually, divine predestination and human free will will come together beyond where you and I can see because it's in the mind of God and we'll understand it better by and by but in the meantime if you're lost if you choose him he'll save you um, brothers and sisters who did he choose who did he choose? He's chosen us. When did he choose you? Before the foundation of the world. Where did he choose you? That you should be holy and without blame before him in love. God just chose you. Now he didn't choose you because you were so good. Because there is none righteous, no, not one. God just sovereignly elects to choose one over another. And when you try to reconcile this matter of predestination, you run against a brick wall because you try to get in the mind of God. And God has kept some things that's a mystery only for him. And a mystery is not that about which we cannot know anything. It's just that about which we cannot know everything. And so I'm just satisfied with the fact that God chose me. He could have chosen somebody else. But he decided to choose me. And he chose me not because he knew I would choose him. He just chose me because he does what he wants to do. It's called sovereignty. Sovereignty means God can do whatever he wants to do. God can elect whomever he wants to elect. You just ought to be glad God chose you. I said you ought to be glad that God chose you. You didn't choose him. He chose you. I'm through now. Um, but in verse number six, there are some consequences to that choosing. And not all consequences are bad consequences. There are some good consequences in verse number six. Uh, I mentioned to the people who were here in the early service that uh, one of my favorite movies is the movie Life uh, with Eddie Murphy and, and Martin Lawrence. Uh, they get in trouble uh, selling whiskey for Spanky. Uh, you gotta watch the movie to, to shout right here. And, and they wind up in jail uh, and uh, they stay, get sentenced to life uh, in prison. And while they're in there, uh, Martin's character has some cornbread that this guy wants. And um, uh, Eddie Murphy's character says, no, 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 let him get his own cornbread. And then the man tells Eddie Murphy, I'm going to take your cornbread. And Eddie Murphy says, if you take my cornbread, there's going to be some consequences and repercussions. Uh, I, I said that to get to this text that if you trust God, if you belong to him, there are some consequences and repercussions. And they're not bad consequences. They are good consequences. The first one is your life is altered forever. 
is right here in verse number six. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved, having been predestinated, verse five, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. When God elects to save you, your life takes on a different trajectory. Somebody here was headed in a downward spiral. But you chose Christ because he chose you and your life went in a different direction. I wish I had two or three witnesses who could help me close this little message by testifying that you were on your way to hell. Your life was in a downward spiral. But once you trusted Jesus Christ, he lifted up your bow down head and the life that was headed downward is now moving in another direction. My life has been altered. And not only is my life altered, but God has adopted me. Uh, listen to me, brothers and sisters. We, we could not get in God's family as children of Abraham. Uh, we are heirs of Abraham's promise. But we are not children of Abraham because Abraham was a Jew and all of his descendants were Jews or Israelites. Israelites indeed. And none of us in here are Jews by birth. So in order for us to get in God's family, we had to be adopted. Uh, God had to just choose us from among other choices. He adopted us. He brought us into the family and we have all the rights and privileges of those who are natural born citizens. You're going to help me close this, won't you? I'm glad about that because God could have left me outside the covenants of promise. The scripture says, you who were dead in trespasses and sins, God has quickened you. God has made you alive. God has adopted you and brought you into his family forever. And since we are in God's family by adoption, that means God has accepted us. We are accepted in the beloved. Brothers and sisters, as I hurry, if God accepts you, don't worry about what other people think of you. If you've been accepted by God, don't let anybody else put any designations on you concerning who you are in Christ Jesus because if you know who you are you'll never let people tell you who they think you are because if Christ accepts me I don't care what you think about me because you didn't save me I said you didn't save me you didn't adopt me you didn't come and get me when I was on my way to hell anybody who loves me enough to come to my rescue Anybody who cares enough about me to accept and adopt me into their family forever and give me riches that are beyond compare is right there in verse number six. I need to give God praise to the glory of his grace. Thank God for grace. I said thank God for grace. I'm trying to leave it alone, brothers and sisters, but me and about 20 more other people here got so much to be grateful for so much to be thankful for because in spite of our wicked ways God has shown grace towards us in spite of all the mistakes we've made in the past God has still been gracious towards us in spite of all the foolishness that's been in our background God still looked beyond our faults and saw all of our needs Thank God I'm rich in his glory. I'm rich in his grace. I'm rich in his blessings. I'm rich in everything that really matters because God has accepted me, adopted me, and brought me into his family. Thank God for new birth. Thank God for new perspective. Thank God that if nobody else wants to befriend me, I already have the best friend I will ever need. If nobody wants to walk with me, I already have somebody to walk with me. If nobody wants to be on, in the pew with me shouting and giving God praise, 
I don't need you to help me praise God because you don't know my story like I know my story. You don't know my testimony like I know my testimony. You can't tell my story like I can tell my story. So if God has not been good to you, I don't blame you. I wouldn't say anything either. If God has not opened doors for you, I don't blame you. Just go right back to sleep. We'll wake you up, turn the lights off, and wake you up before we leave. If God has not made a way for you, I don't mind. You just sit there like you've been sitting since you got here. But if the Lord has opened doors for you, if God has made ways for you, if God has dried your tears, if God has put food on your table, made a way out of no way now is the time and this is the place to tell him thank you for my blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus thank you that my life has been altered thank you that I have been adopted thank you that I have been accepted Thank you that if nobody else loves me, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible, tell me so. Is there anybody here who know God loves you? Is there anybody here who glad God has accepted you? Is there anybody here not ashamed that God has adopted you. If the Lord opened doors for you, you ought to praise his name. If the Lord bless you in spite of your mistakes, you ought to tell God thank you. If the Lord pick you up in spite of the mess you made out of your life, tell God thank you. Why don't you give God the glory? Why don't you give God all the praise he deserves? He deserves your hallelujah. He deserves your opening your mouth. Tell him thank you for my mother. Thank you for my father. Thank you for my old Sunday school teacher. Thank you for my pastor. Thank you for old time religion. Thank you for heavenly vision. Thank you. You brought me out of darkness into your marvelous light. Thank you. I was on my way to hell and you came and found me. Thank you for a man named Jesus born in Bethlehem, reared in Nazareth, Baptized in the Jordan, performed miracles in the desert place, wept over Jerusalem, prayed in Gethsemane. He died, didn't he die? But uh, Sunday morning, God raised him from the dead with all power in his hands. Did he save you? Won't he keep you? Won't he break you? Won't he make a way for you? Say yes! Yeah! Yes! Yeah! I know he's all right. Thank you, thank you for my riches in Christ Jesus. I wish I had a witness here. When I look back over my life and see where God has brought me from, I can't help myself. I gotta tell God, thank you. Why don't you take a minute right now and look back over your life, see all the pitfalls, God led you around. See all the traps people had set for you. But God let you step over them. 
see all the mistakes you made, but he looked beyond your faults and saw all you need. Look at the house you were raised in. Look at the parents God gave you. Look at the education God let you have. Look at the job you got right now. You were not worthy of any of it, but God favored you. God favored you. Tell him, thank you for your favor. Thank you, 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 thank you. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus who chose us from the foundation of the world that we would be blameless in his love having predestinated us he adopted us into his family and now we have been accepted in the